I wondered as I walked in here this morning whether whoever it was that broke into our sacristy and came up to the altar as they drank wine, was there enough light for them to see who was looking down on them? I pray that Jesus' presence touched their heart. We're invited to come as we are today, and we need it too. So let's turn to our Lord Jesus and confess our sins. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor, sinful being. Great good news for you, straight from God. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God to all of you, And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's sing to that wonderful Savior. Is the Lord 
Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. At this time, I would like to invite our scripture reader to come forth and read our first reading. You may be seated. Oh. The Old Testament lesson is from 1 Kings 17, 8 through 16. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to feed you. So he arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Bring me a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to bring it, he called to her and said, Bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. And she said, As the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. And now I'm gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat and die. And Elijah said to her, do not fear, go and do as you have said. But first make me a little cake of it and bring it to me. And afterward make something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, the jar of flour shall not be spent and the jug of oil shall not be empty until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. And as she went and did this, as Elijah said, and she and he and her household ate for many days. The jar of flour was not spent, neither did the jug of oil become empty, according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by Elijah. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This lesson is from Hebrews chapter 9. For Christ has entered, not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood not his own, for then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for man to die once and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly awaiting for him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As we sing this next song together, uh, the yellow prayer cards will be gathered up by the elders. So if you have an opportunity to fill those out, you may do so now. Otherwise, we invite you to sing this song that remembers uh, the Father's love uh, on our behalf as he sent his son. Call out a 
bow no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. Do you? Why don't you do better than that? Why don't you get up and hug him? <laughs> Tell him you're looking great today. <laughs> Share the peace of the Lord. some great news for you. In our announcements today, senior pastor call process is going forward. In fact, it's going so, so quickly forward that we need your input now. So there is a survey. You can find the printed copy out there, or you can go online if that's easier for you to do and give your responses about what you uh, want to see happening next around here. But next week, we're going to do that even more personally with focus groups right after each one of our worship services over there to one of the loggia rooms and an opportunity to dialogue about the traits that you believe are most needed in the next senior pastor and what Trinity needs to be about in the days ahead. And finally, nomination forms. Yes, you get to propose. If you know somebody that you think might be a good candidate to lead Trinity in the future, nomination forms are going to be available next week and for about a month. And then by December, we hope to bring all this together and and report back to you on how things are going, how they're moving forward. So next thing is, we are blessed with the opportunity to welcome Pastor Greg Seltz, Lutheran Hour speaker, to our congregation next Sunday morning. You will be given absolution for skipping 9.30 to come to 11 if you want to do that, because that's when he's going to be preaching. Or if you want to tell the Lutheran Hour speaker that you wanted to listen to Jim Martin rather than Greg Seltz, just show up at 9.30, you know, it'll be okay. Uh, he is one of those dynamic people, if you haven't met him before, who has been involved in inner city ministry and all kinds of other settings. And so we have this amazing opportunity. Friday from about noon on, don't have to be there necessarily the whole time. If you look at, at your schedule and the schedule I've got here for you and say, I can make it to some of this stuff. Our registration fee is only 79 instead of 99 because we're helping to host, and if anybody needs some help with the dollars, talk to me, we'll find a way, because this kind of opportunity doesn't come very often. And so there are workshops in the early afternoon on Friday, and then a great celebration event Friday night, and there are some wonderful speakers Saturday. So what I'm going to do, making sure that everybody has a chance to think about this personally when the clipboard passes you, <laughs> You can join those who have already signed up or those who have said, I'm interested, but I need more information. Or you can just take one of these info packets. There's some stapled ones together there. And just pass that down after you have a chance to think about it. I would hate that we miss out on an opportunity like this to uh, be a blessing to Orlando. And as we have other ways of blessing Orlando, Live UCF, the gala is next Saturday night. Pastor Billy and crew. <laughs> which brings joy to your hearts anyway. And this other a marvelous ministry, Redeeming Life, all those uh, who are in crisis pregnancy situations and need some love and support, we can be helpful to them directly by going to the gala. And, and you believe this? 
we're already thinking about August of 2016 by having a kindergarten roundup so that our kids who are in four-year-old class or your neighbors who might want a Christian education can start thinking about kindergarten here at Trinity. So that's coming up on the 17th. And to get us into Thanksgiving week, a prayer service on the Saturday night before. So that'll happen at 5 o'clock, or about 45 minutes. You can stay for 6 o'clock church if you want, or just come for the, the prayer service itself. And at, with that having been said, it's time for us to stand up for the reading of the gospel lesson for today. And we set this up so that since it's also the text we can go right into the sermon after this reading from Mark chapter 12, verse 38 and following. In his teaching, Jesus said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes, and they like greetings in the marketplaces, and they like to have the best seats in the synagogues and in the places of honor at feasts. <laughs> but they are the ones who devour widows' houses, and for a pretense, they make long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. And Jesus sat down opposite the treasury in the temple and he watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums. And a poor widow came, put in two small copper coins which make a penny, the mite box, the mites as we often heard. And he called his disciples to him and he said to them, truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box, for they all contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put everything that she had, all that she had to live on. This is the gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. This is a text that makes American Christians squirm because what it's saying is when the offering was gathered, Jesus walked up and down the aisles and checked. <laughs> oh, look at that. <laughs> and in most American churches today, if somebody was doing that, they'd be run out in a millisecond, right? <laughs> Jesus wasn't doing it to be nosy. Jesus was fearlessly facing attitudes about giving. He's not checking how much He's doing something much deeper. He's looking into the heart. So back to those first words, and I want to get up here where you can see me. So that's our text for today. He's checking out what people are giving, but let's go on to the next slide from there. And the next slide from there. So he's sitting near the temple treasury and uh, one more slide. Let's see if it comes up here. Must not be there. That's okay. I'll read it to you again. He says, beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes. You can see I don't like to have a long robe on if I don't have to. And like to have the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at feasts, and for a pretense they make their long prayers, they're doing it for show. Chances are, think about this, those guys, when Jesus watched the big bucks that they were dropping into the temple treasury, enjoyed the moment. That rabbi is going to see how much I gave. <laughs> they were eating up the attention. Imagine the chagrin. When Jesus says, that poor widow, those two mites that she put in, she gave a whole lot more than Mr. Deep Pocket sitting over here. She gave all she had to live on. And it's just so Jesus, right? It's classic Jesus, fearlessly facing attitudes about giving that are all messed up because Jesus looks at the condition of the heart. Jesus isn't saying we should give all that we have to live on. Jesus is saying it's not wrong to, to give large sums of money. He's not concerned with the amount, is he? He's looking into the heart. What's the attitude of the giver? 
Are those guys just looking for attaboys for the generosity? Or is it like this poor widow? It's just so grateful. And so she gives what she has. Jesus knew very well you can't tell a book by its cover, and so he looks deeper. Like one uh, congregation consultant, a, a church was going through a very ambitious financial campaign, and they, like churches sometimes do, hired a consultant, and in preparing for the every member visit that he was recommending to them, the fundraiser asked permission to look at the, the list of top givers in the congregation. So I'll keep it confidential, it's just, just for me to understand you better. Well, at the next meeting of the, the stewardship team, as the leaders were questioning the appropriateness of going to every household, including widows on fixed income, he had prepared himself, and he said, please note, <laughs> that the majority of your top 50 contributors are widows and fixed incomes. Now, I don't know if that's the case at Trinity, but in this particular study, this particular congregation, it was. And he went on and said, according to my calculations, widows and fixed incomes contribute about 60% of the budget in this congregation. So I would say that if you want to improve the giving of your congregation, you need to talk to those widows and find out what attitudes in their heart are making them so generous and then infect the rest of the congregation with their attitudes. See, Jesus was not about how much. He was about the condition of the heart. Some of you probably have heard that old grain elevator story at stewardship time. By the way, we're, I'm here to talk about generosity today, not about giving to the congregation's budget. But this, uh, this story is, has been used many times. And any of you grow up in the Midwest where there's one of those great big old 100-foot-tall grain elevators in the general store and nothing else? Because everybody else lives on farms and they bring their grain into town? Well, the congregation used a rotating system of, of who's going to be the finance person for the year. And pastor asked the grain elevator manager if he'd do it. And he said, I, I, I can do it, but please, just honor these two conditions. You, you know that I won't take advantage. Just don't ask me for a report until the end of the year. And during the year, no questions about how we're doing. They didn't have a better idea, so I said, okay. Well, at the end of the year, this is what he reported. You all, with your generosity, have paid off the church debt of $200,000. You have funded the redecorating of the church. You have sent the money to missions as planned. And you've given so much that there's $5,000 still left in the bank account. And people were amazed. How did you do that? He said, you all bring your grain to the elevator. I simply withheld 10% and gave it to the church. <laughs> and you never missed it. <laughs> I suspect that that marvelous example of how God provides if we do things his way would have made Jesus uncomfortable. Why? Because it's forced giving, right? It's not about the attitude of the heart. There are two things in this widow that we need to focus in on for a moment today. Do we have that kind of complete trust in God to provide? Interesting that the Old Testament reading this morning is the story of the widow of Zarephath. Did you catch that, that story? She lives up north in the territory of Sidon, where the Gentiles live. She's not part of the children of Israel. And when Elijah predicts this three-year drought down in Israel, God sends him to live with a widow. Well, if you look carefully, she's a single mom. She's still raising her son. And she's down to her last cup of flour and a few drops of oil for baking. And she explains to Elijah, this is going to be my last meal, and we're going to starve to death. And he says, make something for me first, God's part, and then something for yourselves because God says the flour jar and the oil jug will not be empty until the day the Lord sends rain again. And she trusted God's promise and did not go hungry. I find it fascinating that the very first sermon Jesus preached 800 years later in his hometown synagogue in Nazareth, 
He uses that example. Why? God sent Elijah to a widow who is a Gentile to demonstrate that greater faith is found up there than among the children of Israel. Jesus had no fear of facing the attitudes about giving that people had, the condition of the heart. The question for us this morning that's going to lead us into generosity is, do we have hearts that trust God will provide? And, second thing about this widow, hearts filled with gratitude for God's blessing. There's a great little incident in Mark chapter 14. It uh, is not one of the gospel lessons that we'll read in coming weeks as we continue through Mark, so let me mention it to you right now. You know the story. Jesus was visiting at a home in Bethany, and this woman comes up to him as he's sitting there for the meal, and she's got this alabaster jar. Everybody can tell it's expensive. And she starts pouring the ointment, the perfume that's in it, on Jesus' head. And people are grumbling. How dare she waste all that on him? It could have been sold and money given to the poor and so on. Jesus, who's got this amazing ability to look into the heart, knows she's not doing it to curry favor with him. She's not doing to get applause from the crowd for her generosity. Her heart is filled with gratitude for what he has come to do as Messiah, as Savior. And so Jesus says, she has done a beautiful thing. And wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her, and we're telling about it today, 2,000 years later. Gratitude is what Jesus is looking for in human hearts. Which brings us to preparation for Thanksgiving, an issue of the heart in America, as you well know. Every year, those of us who want to really deal with giving thanks, think back to the first settlers, right? The pilgrims back in, what, 1621? Who had this awful first year in America and half of their community died and yet they propose a Thanksgiving meal with the Wampanoag Indians. It wasn't until 160 years later that a formal day of Thanksgiving was proposed after the Revolutionary War, that's significant, by General George Washington, President George Washington, 1789. But it was about 75 years later when finally Thanksgiving Day became a national holiday, an annual event, right after the end of what war? Civil War. In 1865, Abraham Lincoln proclaimed the fourth Thursday of every November as Thanksgiving Day. By the way, Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, Thursday Thanksgiving Day, 10 o'clock, the opportunity to come and give thanks together in God's house. Now, I mentioned those, those series of just awful times when people said, we need to give thanks to God because it's the truth, isn't it? When we go through tough times, sometimes we get more focused on what we still have to be thankful for than when we have this abundance all around us and it's just the way life always is. So let me add one more to the list. There's a, a man named Martin Rinkart. Well, he was a pastor. Martin Rinkart in Germany back in time of the Thirty Years' War. Any of you history buffs know that that's from 1618 to 1648. And during that Thirty Years' War came the year of the plague when in Rinkart's hometown of Ellensburg, over half the population died. 8,000 people, best they could count. And as a pastor, he buried many of those people, including his wife. And all of that moved him to write a well-known hymn that we'll sing again on Thanksgiving Day. Now thank we all our God with hearts and hands and voices. Heartfelt responses to God's blessings in tough times. Which leads me to talking about Thanksgiving at Trinity and what I learned last week. 
coming to church here and meeting Millie Fink and friends, which gave me the opportunity to meet Bob Blackwood's brother David. Is that right, David? Who, if I heard his story straight, is the one who posted a sermon by Pastor Fink on YouTube, all good so far, which I enjoyed watching and listening to and seeing that the pulpit wasn't in the church that day. You know this story? Because he had requested to preach from the pulpit and the service was being held over in the gym. <laughs> so the whole pulpit was over there. Anyway, I'm listening to Pastor Fink preach and he's talking about the ups and the downs. The ups and the downs and how there have been some really challenging times in the history of Trinity Congregation over 90 years and he's talking about how God remained faithful through all of it. One of those challenging years around here. Amazing blessings with the new building and all the ministry that's happening with nearly 300 kids enrolled in the CDC and K-8 doing, doing much better. And, and we're just scraping by the expenses and the offerings. They're matching. We're not quite up to budget, but we haven't spent more than what we've received. But that's not what I'm here to talk about today. It's, it's that cycle, right? Up and down over the years. And how do you give thanks in the middle of all of that? Well, here's what happened for me, and, and, and it's happening for us together. I'm working with the, the foundations class, the new members class, and there are a lot of CDC staffers taking that class, and, and they don't have to do it to join, but many of them have their own home church. But we want them to understand what, what we teach here at Trinity, how Lutherans uh, interpret Scripture and so on. And just a, a couple of new members this time around, and, and so it didn't seem appropriate to say, well, new members come to welcome to the church day on November 22nd and stay for Thanksgiving dinner and you CDC people who took the class don't come. So well, let's call it welcome to the family day because they really are part of the family. In fact, they're here a lot more hours than most of us are and, and they're holding snotty-nosed kids and, and they're hugging babies and they're teaching three and four-year-olds to say prayers to Jesus and they're doing this fantastic job. And, and so uh, Patty Moser said, well, if you'll invite them, to welcome to the family day. I'll, I'll come and introduce him. So that's 11 a.m. two weeks from now. And then we got to thinking, and, and why would we just introduce those who have gone through the foundations class? Why don't we just invite all of our CDC staff and ask them to stay for Thanksgiving dinner? And we could have like a staff appreciation dinner and the people from Trinity who don't get to see them in action could meet them while we're eating Thanksgiving dinner together. We'll have a great time. And, Oh yeah, they, they're like our heroes because back in, in mid-August, how did they do that? They moved out of the old classrooms into the new building overnight. <laughs> and when they did that, the K-8 to staff had new built rooms available to them and, and they moved over the weekend. And yeah, they need to be appreciated and a whole lot of other staff people around here. So, the leadership council and the school board have said it would be an honor to wear aprons and serve our staff people. Give thanks to God for these amazing servants that we've been blessed with here. So that's what's going to happen at Thanksgiving dinner, and I can't wait to be serving the pies because I might sidetrack a cherry pie. <laughs> to have fun together, to say, oh God, in the middle of challenges, you blessed us richly, we're a church family, we're coming together. So Rich Poole is going to make like 400 meals. And then again on Tuesday for the school Thanksgiving dinner, he's going to make like 400 meals. He said, so Rich, what do you do on Thanksgiving Day? Because I'll be long gone. He said, could you teach us how to make another 100 meals so we could have a community dinner so we could serve the homeless or, or maybe people who are in shelters, people who don't have a place to have Thanksgiving. I'm sure, I can do that. I don't know how he's going to work his magic, but, 
But when I passed the, the sheet around uh, a couple weeks ago at our ministry team's gathering, after Thanksgiving Day, when you've eaten too much turkey and you're feeling guilty again, <laughs> how would you like to come to church the day after, on Friday after Thanksgiving, and serve the homeless? A dozen hands went up right away. We're going to make sure that anybody else who wants to serve that day has a chance to do so because you realize that when Thanksgiving overflows into the lives of other people, that's when it really feels like you're giving thanks, right? We're going to do something else. We're going to write down things we're thankful for the next couple of weeks in church, and we're going to make sure that those are all published around Thanksgiving and the weekend following that. But and I'm going to learn more about things that we do to be a shining light in the community around here. I actually got the tour the other day with, uh, oh no, I just blanked out. Our maintenance man, who I listened, well, I watched as he showed me how he's going to put 20,000 lights on the star. <laughs> you know? Thank you, Bill. Yeah. I don't know I was going to call him Rick, but he's, he's Bill. He can be Bill forever. <laughs> and he showed me how you guys put that star up there and how we're going to do that right after uh, the first Wednesday Advent service on December 2nd. And then I heard kids practicing in here because the gift is happening on December 4th and we get to be light out there around Lake Eola in the band shell. And, and yeah, <laughs> that's how we show Thanksgiving for what Jesus has done for us. We let the light of Jesus shine more brightly into the community around us because it's real obvious from whoever was behind that altar looking for wine that there are some people who really need the Lord Jesus in their hearts. And my dear friend up front here said, but don't you worry. <laughs> because if that person was right next to Jesus as they were drinking up that wine, <laughs> every time they think back, Jesus is going to be speaking into their heart. We're going to be praying that that happens and whoever, one person or however many there were here, that, that the Lord will touch them with his grace and mercy and forgiveness and hope for the future. Here's the story about Jesus. Rich as he was up in heaven, he became poor for us so that by his poverty, we might become rich, that we might inherit heaven one day. That's what the Apostle Paul says about Jesus, that amazing gift of the gospel, the free gift of forgiveness, God's love, a home in heaven. So how do we let generosity, as rich as God's generosity in Christ, flow? Well, the Bible talks about three kinds of over and above giving. Generosity, purely voluntary. First example comes out of Macedonia. Paul is writing to the Corinthians saying, let me give you this great example. The church is up in northern Greece. They heard that I was going to take an offering back to Jerusalem where people are in a famine and they're just desperately hungry and, and oh, by the way, it's the place where Jesus and the first Christians came from and you owe your very souls to them. And the people in Macedonia said, Paul, we're not doing so well, but would you allow us to send some offering money along with, uh, with you? Paul says to the Corinthians, uh, their own extreme poverty, in the midst of that, they have overflowed in a wealth of generosity. Paul writes, God's always rich enough to make you generous at all times, however he moves you. So we're going to do some more of that. November 28th and 29th, yeah, you've been seeing the notes. It's bring food in and discretionary fund to help the needy. Not how much we give. Not whether you have extra food in the house that particular day. But it's the condition of the heart, right? We want to share because Jesus has shared with us. Another great example, all the way back in the Old Testament, building a tabernacle, Moses... Uh, He's reporting on, on how people have responded to this plea for what they need out there in the wilderness to, to have a, a movable sanctuary. And he says, everyone whose heart stirred him, everyone whose spirit moved him, they didn't get a dunning letter saying, you owe this much. <laughs> no. 
out of their own goodwill, free will, they came and brought the Lord's contribution for the tent of meeting. I don't know if you've ever noticed this one. The very next chapter, Exodus chapter 36, Moses says, let no man or woman do anything more for the sanctuary, for the contribution. What he's saying is, you gave too much. Stop it. <laughs> Can you imagine that happening? Out there in the wilderness, they brought stuff together, and Moses said, we've got all we need to do this tabernacle. Gifts over and above generosity. There's one that I know that you particularly enjoy. It's the third over and above kind of giving in the Bible, missionary support. The example is the Apostle Paul. Philippi is up in the northern part of Greece. He wants to get down to Athens and Corinth where they desperately need the gospel, and he says, can you help me out? You Philippians entered into partnership with me when I left Macedonia. Now, I haven't done a very good job this fall reminding you that we support the Trump family in Kenya, the Klausings in Eastern Africa, the Wasmans in South Korea, the Laymans in Spain. It's like all over the world. Billy at UCF, Redeem Life up in Sanford, Lutheran Hour Ministries and so on. Generosity opportunities abound. And so you respond as God touches your heart. But you never know when the very personal one may come like happened to a pastor in a church where the habit was to put a boutonniere on the pastor before he led worship every week. And like habits, at first it was very special, but after a while it was just, it's what happened. Until one day, when a little boy came up to pastor after church and said to him, Pastor, what are you going to do with that flower? If you're just going to throw it away, could I take it home with me? Sure. Why? Well, I'm going to give it to Granny. See, Mom and Dad got divorced last year. I lived with Mom until she got remarried, and then I went to live with Dad, and he realized that being at work and all, he couldn't take care of me, and so he sent me to Granny. And Granny's been so good to me. I just want to give her one pretty flower for loving me. Well, suddenly, that boutonniere looked very special to the pastor. Felt his eyes misting over. Got this inspiration in his heart that told him God was at work here. And as he started unpinning the flower, he said to the little boy, follow me up to the altar. took one of the bouquets of flowers and said, here, take this to Granny. She deserves the very best. The boy said, a wonderful day. I ask for a flower and I get a beautiful bouquet. Two hearts were touched in church that day, weren't they? That little boy and that pastor and the third heart was about to be touched when Granny got her flowers at home. May the Lord touch my heart and yours with gratitude for his blessings and generosity to let them flow into other people's lives. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for showing us the most generous act of all, coming from heaven to earth, from riches to rags, so that we might be taken from the rags of sin to the riches of heaven. Help us to overflow with generosity in gratitude for all that you have done for us. We pray in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen? Amen. I'm guessing it's time to sing. Sure, it's always time to sing. <laughs> and we got a great song to sing, and this is not a, a sit-down kind of song, is no, it? No. Uh, yeah, nah. If you get into it, you just want to stand up, okay. <laughs> sure. Why don't we stand and sing Give Thanks as the uh, offering is taken up as well. Yes, yes. <laughs> Jesus Christ. 
give thanks. With our offerings, Lord, dollars to support ministry. With our hearts, so blessed by your love and forgiveness. With our willingness to serve, to care for people in need, to reach out to those who don't know you. Accept our thanks for all you've done for us, we pray in your holy name. And as we turn to our congregational prayers, Father in heaven, it's your world, but we see the shortage of gratitude. And we ask that you just pour out your spirit in abundance all over this globe, that people would have their eyes open and they'd recognize the good giver of every perfect gift on earth. You, almighty God, please send your spirit, Lord, in your mercy. And Lord Jesus, this is your church, we're your people, and we just ask that you would infect our hearts with the spirit of generosity that made you choose to leave heaven and come to earth for us, Lord, in your mercy. And our special petitions this morning. Father in heaven, we pray for Debbie's daughter, whose mother passed away. We pray you would bless her, comfort her with your love, and provide for her needs. Father, we pray for Sherry, who is suffering with Parkinson's. Please heal her body, O Lord. Father, we pray for the person or persons that entered here a slave to the flesh. Free them, O Lord. May the seed of faith be planted, and they have the courage to return with hope, seeking your forgiveness, knowing it will be granted, and all heaven will rejoice. Lord, in your mercy. These and all the things that are in our minds and on our hearts, dear Father, we bring to you in the name of Jesus, and we join together in his family prayer, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, after the meal that night, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Peace of the Lord be with you all. Amen. You may be seated as we prepare for the Lord's meal.
stand in him complete. Jesus died my soul to save. My lips shall still repeat. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe.
thank you, Lord Jesus, for this holy meal, for giving us assurance of forgiveness, for reserving a place for us in heaven, for promising to live inside of us, letting your light shine through us so the world can know that we belong to you and that you want them to come to you as well. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Let's stand, and may this sacrament strengthen and keep you in true faith into life everlasting. Amen. Let's pass on the benediction of the Lord right now as we say together, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Serve the Lord.